On today's episode, we'll be talking about Ouija boards, spirits, dark entities, and much more. All coming up on this edition of Midweek Mysteries. Thank you for joining me, and welcome. I am your host, as always, Nick Ryan. Before we start, I'd like to say thank you to everyone for tuning in. Your support and generosity is always amazing. If you enjoy the show, please remember to subscribe, share, and review the podcast. This supports us by helping new listeners to discover the show. And if you'd like to support us even further by becoming a patron or by donating, please visit us at patreon.com slash paranormalmysteries or at buymeacoffee.com slash paranormal. These links and others can be found in the show notes. And if you've encountered the paranormal and would like to share your story, please email me at paranormalmysteriespodcast at gmail.com. All experiences, no matter how big or small, are always welcome. And with that in mind, our first midweek mystery comes to us from Martin. And Martin's story is called UFO and a ghost. Martin says, Hi Nick. Firstly, I just want to say how much I love your show. I live in the northeast of the UK, and I normally listen to your show when I'm out walking, or if I'm awake during the night, as sometimes I have difficulty sleeping. I have listened to a huge amount of your back catalog, and really enjoy episodes featuring ghosts, cryptozoology, and other less common topics. I have two stories for you that have been handed down from my mother that I'm sure you would be interested in. These stories sparked a lifelong interest in the paranormal for me. The first was a UFO sighting that involved five people and took place in Blythe, a town on the northeast coast of England. It involved my mother, my grandma, my cousin, another cousin, and her friend. This obviously deserves some credibility, as there were five people present. This happened back in 1963, seven years before I was born. My mother said it was a Tuesday night in July, and about 9.20 p.m. in the evening, so given the time of year, it would have been still light outside. My cousin and her friend were playing outside in the back lane of the street where they lived. My mother and grandmother were in the house babysitting, as my cousin's mother and father were out for the evening. They heard a strange noise, so they sent one of the cousins outside to check on my other cousin and her friend. She came back in the house white as a sheet, saying that there was something flying above the chimney tops, and that my other cousin and her friend were lying on the ground in the back lane, and couldn't get up. My mother and Gran went out to investigate, and did indeed find my cousin and her friend lying on the ground looking up at the sky. Upon looking up, they saw a disc-shaped object, just above the chimney tops. It was silver and had a traditional saucer-shaped bottom that had lights on it and was rotating. My cousin later went on to say that she and her friend had seen windows in the side of the craft and occupants looking out. She also went on to say that they could not get up and felt pinned to the ground. After a few moments, the craft shot directly up at tremendous speed to the point that it looked like a star in the sky. They all say that the dot in the sky darted around in the sky at tremendous speed before disappearing. This was definitely not a helicopter, as there was no noise or wind, and also given this was 1963, helicopters were very uncommon in the area, and there were no police helicopters back then. My mother is 82 and still with us. My cousin is now in her 60s and is almost reclusive. Who knows what would have happened if my mother and Gran had not gone out to investigate that night. We have often pondered if an abduction was on the cards. My grandma was always a stereotypical skeptic throughout her life. However, she was never able to explain what she saw that night. The second story handed down to me was given again from my mother and involved what we now say was a poltergeist, as at this time it was thought of as a ghost, and it was even nicknamed Fred. This took place in a small village called Cambois, not far from Blythe, in Northumberland. The activity took place in the house where my mother and father lived when I was born back in 1970. It was a colliery house, as my father worked in the coal mines. 
Again, there were multiple witnesses of the activity over several years, and this involved knocking on walls, doors opening, the pet cat hissing and raising the hair on her back at what would seem to be nothing. One more frightening encounter was when my aunt and her husband slept over, and when he went to bed, he felt someone sitting on the end of the bed, so he couldn't stretch his legs out properly, and when he looked, there was no one there. He refused to ever sleep over again. Things then took a nasty turn just before we moved out. I was less than a year old, and the event could have been triggered because we were moving out, or because I was born. We don't know. However, my dad was working late one night, and my mother had just put me in my cot to sleep for the night. When she started to go down the stairs, the light pendant at the top of the stairs started to swing violently, to the point where the bulb smashed. My mom, obviously plunged into darkness, had to go back up the stairs in the dark to retrieve me from my cot, as I was obviously wide awake and now crying. My mom always remembers the glass from the bulb crunching under her feet as she crossed the landing, where the pendant was still swinging violently above her. I honestly believe both of these encounters, given that both had multiple witnesses, and no one could explain either of them. Thank you again for creating your show, and I look forward to many future episodes. Our next story of the night comes to us from Elena, and Elena's story is called Nightwalker. Elena says, Hi there. First off, I just want to say that I love your podcast, and I am so sorry if this gets really long. I listen to it every day, and it makes me happy to know that I am not alone when it comes to the paranormal. I am a very strong believer in this kind of stuff, and have looked at a bunch of places to go and explore with friends in the near future. If you share this on your podcast, I just want to say thank you in advance, and I wish you all the best. What I'm about to tell you is something that only my closest friend knows, and now I'm going to share it with you, in hopes that someone can come up with an explanation about what happened. About three years ago, I was at my friend's house, let's call her Sam. We had been watching videos on YouTube about going to haunted places and investigating the paranormal. We were both very intrigued by this kind of stuff, and still are. Sam's grandmother was a very spiritual woman, and kept objects around the house to communicate with the other side. She thought that we should do some investigating of our own, and me, being a young girl in middle school, thought that it sounded fun. We got out an old Ouija board that hadn't been used in a decade or so, and started to mess around with it. We broke a lot of rules, which I'm guessing started the whole thing, but we thought nothing of it. Sam and I didn't make contact with anything for about 10 or 15 minutes, so Sam got bored and said that she had to go use the restroom. I was left alone in the living room for a while, and was a little freaked out because Sam wasn't making much sound. I figured that she was just on her phone, playing a game or something, so I wasn't concerned. Her mom was out of the house and was at a party, but she loved me as one of her own, and she trusted us that we would be safe and responsible. Sam had now been in the bathroom for about 20 minutes, and I was concerned, so I got up and went to go and knock on the door. But right when I got up, I heard my name come from her mom's bedroom. I stopped in my tracks and turned around. The bedroom door was still shut, and I knew her mom wasn't home. I ran over to the bathroom door and was about two feet away when the door handle to the bathroom started to violently move back and forth, like someone from the inside was trapped inside. I didn't care if Sam was still going to the bathroom, and I flung open the door. She was crouched in the doorway and panting. Oh, very funny, I said. What? she yelled back at me. I was surprised and said, You were trying to scare me by jiggling the door handle. I'm not gonna lie, you really scared me. She then looked at me with such fright, a shiver went down my spine. Didn't you hear me yelling, she said, and then stood up shaking. I was really confused, because it was dead silent before I had opened the door. I asked her what she was talking about, and she then explained that she had been finished for a while, and when she went to open the door, it was locked. She thought that I was holding the door so that she couldn't get out. About five minutes had passed, and she was yelling at me to open the door, and screaming for help, but I had stayed silent. It wasn't until the door had been violently shaken that she was able to know that it wasn't me holding the door, and then she had seen my face when I opened it, and Sam told me that I looked like I had seen a ghost. We were both really freaked out by this, and decided to call her mom to check in, and then go to bed. We put away the Ouija board in the closet, 
and closed the door to her bedroom. Sam had fallen asleep first, and I followed about 15 minutes after. I suddenly woke up around 3 a.m., and I was sweaty. I think I had had a bad dream, but I've never been able to remember what it was. But I remember seeing a misty black figure, around the same size as me, standing over Sam's sleeping body. I was paralyzed with fear, and I didn't know what to do. Sam was shaking from a bad dream, and so was the black figure. I whispered Sam's name, hoping that she would wake up and that I wouldn't attract the figure's attention, but she didn't wake up. I said her name louder and louder, but neither Sam or the figure were phased. I sat up at this point, ready to call her mom or the police. Then suddenly the figure turned toward me, and I froze. I stared at it, and it stared back at me. I don't know how to describe the feeling, other than having a bunch of people in a crowd staring at you. I felt exposed and scared. I then started to hear whispers as I kept staring at it, but I was too afraid to look away. The whispers started to become louder and louder until they were screams. I covered my ears and squinted my eyes, but they were in my head. I felt cold, and I didn't take my eyes off the figure. And then it lunged at me, and then disappeared. The noises then stopped, and I was left in silence, my heart beating out of my chest, and my body cold and shaky. Sam jumped to life and screamed my name, and then I ran over and hugged her crying, and she was crying as well. She didn't have a bad dream, but she said that she was awake, and it felt like she was paralyzed. Sam doesn't have sleep paralysis, and neither do I, but she saw the figure standing over her, and she heard my screams, but they were muffled, and she could hear the same whispering sounds that I could, but they were constant. She also saw it lunge at me, but the end result was different. I saw it disappear, but she saw it sit in me, like it was me all along. I felt like myself. I had full control, and I felt the same as before. Then she woke up, and there I was, exactly how she saw me when she was asleep. The next morning, I wore a tank top and noticed that there was something weird on my chest, a scar that was on my chest close to my heart, and then I noticed that Sam had the exact same scar in the same place, and she didn't know where it was from either. My parents have no idea where it came from, so I can only assume that it was from that mysterious figure from that night. Thank you for reading this and have an amazing year, and may you be safe wherever you are. Elena Our next story comes to us from Katya, and Katya's story is called Ghost or Maybe Demon. Katya says, This is about the apartment I used to live at in California. Me and my mom had many experiences there, and I have one from my mom and myself. My mom had been in the shower, and she had felt something touch her shoulder. She thought it was me scaring her, and she yelled out for me to stop, but the bathroom door was locked. She proceeded to tell it that it was not welcome, and my grandfather and mother always told me that the second it touches you, it's bad, and to tell it to leave. My story is also in the same apartment. The layout of this apartment was long, deep, and somewhat weird. Everything was to one side, and on the right was a long hallway. Then, towards the back of the apartment are the rooms and bathroom. My bedroom is first, then the bathroom, and then my parents' room. So one night, my parents had been out of town, and I was alone. I had heard the door open, and I went to look, but once I turned to go down the hallway, there was something squatting on all fours. It proceeded to run towards me, and I ran to my room, locking my door, and then I went to my closet, and I locked it as well. Then everything started to shake, like an earthquake, and then I heard screaming. I was praying and holding up a cross, and then it stopped. I then went a few houses down and asked my classmates to sleep over. Our next story comes to us from Denise, and Denise's story is called Haunted Apartment. Denise says, This story took place in 1986. My apartment, large by New York City standards, had several rooms with high ceilings and glass-paned doors. Since I lived by myself, I closed off some of the rooms throughout the day. Occasionally, doors that were usually opened, I found closed, and those that I kept closed were sometimes opened, and in the beginning, I didn't give it much thought. I had started a new teaching job, and directly after work, I went to a large warehouse where I was part of a stage crew, 
building props for a huge festival to be held at a well-known New York City venue. Working past midnight on most evenings, I usually arrived at home, exhausted. One night, as I entered the apartment, I found the cap from a soda bottle in the middle of the hallway. I do not drink soda, and the cap looked brand new. I had two new kittens at the time, and I assured myself that they had found the bottle cap, hidden in some nook or cranny. It didn't make much sense, so I let it go. The kittens were blamed for a lot of things, but when I found them in a closet, with the door closed behind them, I could not make sense of that either. Before too long, things began to happen that were impossible to ignore. One night, when I arrived home very late, I walked into my bedroom to find the window over my bed, wide open. I turned on my heels and ran as fast as I could out of the apartment and banged on the door of an elderly couple, who were kind enough to let me in, to call the police. It was about 2 a.m., and the police met me at the apartment and searched everywhere. If someone was here, they're not here now, they said, and then left. Entering the bathroom that night, I found that the water in the toilet bowl was milky white, with gray-white ashes floating on top. It could be that an intruder or some prayer occupant was entering the apartment. My roommate had left several years ago, so I ruled her out, but things just didn't make sense. Strangely, I didn't feel afraid, and that didn't make sense, either. The incident that convinced me that I was experiencing the paranormal was the day that my keys disappeared. I always placed my keys on the kitchen table when I arrived home, in the same place. One afternoon, after arriving from work and having to leave soon after, I went to fetch the keys, and they were not on the kitchen table. I hunted high and low throughout the apartment. They were not to be found. Since I had another set, I left. I arrived later that evening to find that the keys were sitting right on the kitchen table, exactly where they were originally placed, earlier that afternoon. Although events were taking place that were out of the ordinary, I chose to go through my daily routine as if nothing had changed. I had no explanation for what was happening, and I didn't look for one either. Three occurrences happened throughout the year, and each one, again, had no explanation. One night while sleeping, I was awakened by a loud bang. At first I thought it was a gunshot from the street, but a voice inside said, No, that came from inside the apartment. I jumped out of bed and ran toward the front door to escape, but for some reason I decided to turn around. Behind me was one of the doors that I had kept open. It had slammed shut. I instantly knew that that was what I had heard. I opened the door slowly, and the room was dark and cold. Another thing that I also remember is that directly before I heard that loud bang, I felt as if I had levitated or was floating, and as I was lowering down toward the bed, my legs were kicking gently, as if I was treading water. When I finally landed, the bang occurred. The next two experiences can be simply stated. My front door was ripped off its hinges. I clearly wasn't at home at the time, and I don't remember the specifics. I just know what I saw. The final experience was when I came home to find that every piece of white paper that I seemingly owned was thrown on the floor in one of the rooms. It looked like it had been snowing. It was probably at this point that I thought to call a paranormal investigator. I read about a parapsychologist named Dr. Osis in the New York Times, so I called his number, but the voice on the answering machine scared me more than anything that I had been through, and he never called me back. Throughout all of this, I had never felt fear. I think it was because I suspected that I was the catalyst for what was happening. My new teaching job was in special education, and many of my students were at risk. The work that I was doing as part of the stage crew was far beyond what I thought I was capable of, and I was being pushed to the brink, emotionally and physically. In the end, the project that I was given to complete for the festival was the only one in my crew that had full approval and didn't have to be redone. I went on to teach for several years, and I look back on a wonderful career. I still have unexplained things happening at a house that I have bought in the country, and I'm a volunteer at what has been called the most haunted house in New York City. But those are stories for another day. Thank you for allowing me to share. As tonight's edition of Midweek Mysteries comes to an end, I'd like to thank all of you for tuning in, and a special thank you goes out to Martin, Elena, Katya, and Denise for sharing their experiences. 
If you've witnessed something that you can't explain, please contact me at paranormalmysteriespodcast at gmail.com or visit paranormalmysteriespodcast.com and click on the Tell Your Story link. All of our contact information can be found in the show notes. Until next time, I hope you all have a safe and healthy rest of the week, and we'll see you back here on Friday with our next episode. From all of us at Paranormal Mysteries, thank you for listening, and please remember, don't wait for the unknown to come to you. Get out there and find it. <laughs>